Okay. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, that should be better. Yeah. Nancy took one look at me and said no. Um, it was so it, while we are really good at Okay. Are we back? Maybe. <laughs> Uh, let's try now. People have to let me know. Here's me. Here's Pamela. Hi. Here's us. Do I exist? Do we exist? Yeah, that was a hard crash. Wow. I just like, it just went crunch. I've never, I've never seen that before. I've never really? seen OBS just, just get smashed like that. Yeah. Okay, you do not stretch the limits of what it is able to do. I guess that's it. I just, you know, record for one hour and then I call it a day as opposed to <laughs> gaming and importing a whole bunch of different streams all together and compiling a post and then outputting it out to both YouTube and Twitch. Yeah. Yeah, it's often bringing in web alerts that is what completely um, kills us. Mm. Got it. Uh, Arecibo. Yeah, she's dead, Jim. <laughs> Although there's like a tiny little bit of hope because what I understand is that it's not, it's absolutely going to be shut down. It's that the people who are deciding what to do with it say that they want to shut it down. The people who fund it are saying we're not going to fund it anymore, yeah, yeah. except so, for decommissioning costs. Right. So, so, and and mainly in the short term, it's to try to minimize the, uh, you know, to minimize the danger, the risks of of yeah. people. It gets like the thing is going to collapse at any moment. But well, but you never know. They might find out. They might look at it and realize, oh, it's actually a fairly easy fix. We can get it stabilized, and maybe they can come back online. But I mean, we were looking at Arecibo getting canceled years ago. Like it's, yeah. it's amazing that it survived this long. And, and it was on the docket to be decommissioned from, that's the wrong word. It was on the docket to have its federal funding removed. And they were looking for outside organizations to take over management of it, right. by which I mean costs. So... I'm pretty sure we've lost it. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. I'm not I'm not saying like there's a lot of hope. I'm saying there's like a teensy tiny little bit of hope. Just and my job is to be the pessimist around here. Yeah. 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 You bring us all down. It's what I do. Wah wah. Um let's see. Uh so uh, I hope you've all had a chance to say hello. So I'm gonna say hello back. Hello to Andrew Planet, Eddie Cowley. Beatrix Lidner, Beth Johnson, Bart Clankar, Cherry, Corey S., Daniel McCool, Elit Avron, Eric Knapp, Gordon Dewis, Guido Bibra, Hal McKinney, Harry M., Helg Bierkog, Hugo Burnham, Ian Farkeron, Jack Tles, John Suffill, uh, Katrina Astro YYZ, Quad Libet, Larry Beckham, Larry King, Linda Sadiq, Luke Duke, Magnus, Maria Kovitz, Paul Disney, Raj Luthra, Raj Wilson, Sergusi, Subject Line, Tesla Ranger, Thomas Tranaker, Wayne Johnson, and Zap Fan Zap. And hey, everybody. And, and to all of you over on Twitch, uh, hello to Surgacy, hello to Broken Symmetry, hello to DPI 209, hello to Flying Blind, hello to Mike Cassidy, hello to Sir Grumpy Bear, <laughs> and all the rest of you over on Twitch. Um, you let Avron, would you, wants to know about black holes, um, that you would calculate how long, if you could be stuck in the event horizon of a black hole until the end of time, would that be affected if the black hole evaporates? Depends on your perspective, right? If you're, if you're inside the black hole, then you experience a short death. But if we're watching somebody fall mm -hmm. into a black hole from the outside, yeah. then they freeze on the surface. And it's terrible to everyone you love. It's 
just normal death to you. Right, right. But, but, and this is part of why Hawking came up with the information paradox is yeah. that you're seeing some, you're seeing the image of something that is falling into the black hole and then the black hole evaporates. So what does that mean? Did the yeah. information go in? How does it come out? So that this, this is, this has not been solved yet. They keep saying it's solved. We yeah. There was like a big, it. did you read that story where someone was like, yeah. like we've, we, it's been solved. And then as you get deeper into the article, it's like, and it hasn't gotten solved. Right. So right. I think someone wrote the title is different from the person who wrote the, uh, well, uh, that's always true. I mean, editors know that writers cannot be trusted to write our own titles. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is my job. So if you, if you ever read a uh, universe today, um, I write every title on the website. So, and this is because you actually understand like how are things going to get searched for? How are things going to get found? And it's not just being clever. It's you have to be optimized. Yeah. Yes. Um, you have to walk that line between clickbait and, and being correct. Yeah. You got to know when to use your weasel words and when to not. All right, so for those of you who are wondering what it is that you have stumbled into, um, we are about to record an episode of Astronomy Cast. Um, it'll take us, I don't know, some random amount of time, and then we will finish, and then we'll stick around and we'll answer your questions about space and or astronomy. Um, I probably have to duck out pretty quickly, though. Um, okay. Yeah, I've got a, a wife recovering from some knee surgery that I'm going to help out but you got it and and we're we're threading the needle between leaf blowings while they're picking yeah. up the leaves next yeah. door yeah yeah um so the uh, yeah the least invasive best possible most successful knee surgery but still it's it's still knee surgery so yeah um all right uh so let what me episode number are this we on this is 585 okay Hmm. The dog has lost it. Just now. You just discovered this yes. now. Okay. We're... Should I go get the dogs? Uh, no. Fine. Okay. okay. We will go forward with okay. the dogs. Let me know All when right. you're ready to press record. I have pressed record. We are recording. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you should. Okay, I will be right back. I'm just gonna stop my yeah, audio completely. Uh, all right. That's cool. Um, so someone is mentioning that. Uh, uh, who is it? Janet, Janet Levin uh, talked about this and I actually, I'm going to try to be interviewing. They reached out to see if I wanted to interview her. So I'm going to try to do a, an interview with her as well about, about black holes. So stay tuned on that. <laughs> Katrina asked her why I was edit saying that uh, Amazon turned up. That's, that's, I'm sure that's what it is or the leaf blower person you're lucky this show happened today. It was touch and go because there was a person with a uh, little leaf blower uh, uh, was running all day and it just stopped just minutes ago. Uh, our own Fraser, does your dog bark? Our dog, our dog does bark. It's pretty funny to hear her bark because our, we have a deaf dog, but she dil, still does bark and doesn't sound like sounds like she doesn't know what barking sounds like. But she does make the noises, so it's pretty funny. She, uh, and you know, we've I've mentioned this before that we, you know, we've been teaching her how to dog. Um, the latest trick is catching food. So we're at the point now where our dog, like, just these basic dog things, she didn't know how to do. And so you would throw pieces of food at her, and they would just bounce off her face, and then Get she one. would realize that food had come Get her one. way, and then she would go and find it from the ground. And now she's gotten to the point where she's gotten pretty good at catching food that we throw 
in her general direction. She'll snap out at it and grab it. And then the other thing we've taught her is to like play with toys and chase a ball. So she, uh, that's a lot of dog there. Um, we, we will, <laughs> that's a, that dog has no mass to wag. And so it just wags its whole behind. <laughs> you, you don't see the damping effect of a tail. <laughs> Eddie, don't steal my lunch. So, uh, no. yeah, so we, so we, our dog had no interest whatsoever in toys, balls, anything. We finally got her to, like, she, I, we're not sure she's enjoying the process, but she knows that it makes us happy when she chases a ball. So that's good enough for her. And so we will, <laughs> we'll throw a ball. She'll run down, grab the ball, bring it back, and and have no interest in doing it again. And then you gotta, you gotta like. Um, you got to bribe her to do it again. You're like, come on, this oh, is fun. Man. Yeah. You're like, okay, fine. But if, if it's, if it's fun for you, it's fun for me. Let's do it. So yeah. Yeah. Our dog is, uh, is, is, you can just see that, that she just wasn't raised in a, uh, in a normal way, in a good way. So yeah, Malachi, he he still doesn't know how to play real well with humans because he's fairly sure we're going to do bad things to him. Oh, but he'll run into a room now and steal a toy and run away with it. And you can hear him off in the distance squeaking it. OK, Eddie, Eddie, my dear, my love. <laughs> you need to get down. Lie down. Ignore me completely. He just got his giant cone of shame removed yesterday, and he's mm. still a bit much. Yeah. All right. Um, shall we start over? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Right. Glad you uh, you you stopped those barking dogs and replaced them with panting dogs. That's true. Mike's picking that up, isn't it? <laughs> it's better. It's an improvement. Yes. All right. All right. All right. You ready? I am pressing record. I have also pressed I have record. Pressed record. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 585, Super Earths, Mini Nip. <laughs> Astronomy Cast, episode 585, Super Earths, Mini Neptunes, Gas Dwarfs. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I am doing well. To those of you watching this on video, we are threading the needle between the, the neighbor's gardener blowing the leaves and picking up the truly enormous Hallmark special size leaf pile. And the dogs were afraid of the leaf blower and quiet and enthralled and barking at the picking up the leaves. So I now have 130 pounds of dog in the studio with me. Right. And you may occasionally see fur enter the edge of the camera field. <laughs> right. If you're watching. But the, yes. and, and definitely for the people hearing the, the podcast, you are going to hear the, the panting uh, of dogs, which is preferable to the barking of dogs, which is what to, and the leaf blower. It has been a day, which has. has been part of a week. Um, for those of you who are wondering what happened for the last couple of weeks, Pamela was in uh, grant proposal madness and, and just couldn't spare any time. So, so we just took a couple of weeks off. Which is now let's put this let's say what really happened. Nancy Graziano took one look at me last week because yeah. I was willing and she's like, no, <laughs> I was right. mommed and she made the correct choice. That's probably thank best. you, Nancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we probably could have, uh, you know, made a show of whatever was left with your brain, maybe, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's uh, makes total sense to me. All right, so astronomers are finding even more new extrasolar planets, and they're starting to discover entirely new categories. There are classes of planets out there that we just don't have any analog here in the solar system. Let's talk about them. Uh, we've been running a whole bunch of these stories 
you know, we, the title is is Super Earth's Mini Neptune's Gas Dwarfs. I love, right, a gas dwarf. Like, what is that? A gas giant, but it's small? Right. It, a mini Neptune? What's that? And then, of course, the Super Earth. Uh, so how far of a variety are astronomers starting to find of other worlds than what we have here in the solar system? Well, we're, we're seeing two different factors. The, the first factor is that there's a fairly good continuum of planets of different sizes. There's some gaps in there. there there's a notable gap right before you hit ice giants. But um, as things are getting developed, press officers and scientists don't always know what to call things. So as near as I can tell, they make things up and move along. Right. And and so in the preparation for this story, because I, I've honestly been struggling with this myself as I read things, because I'll see mega Earths, I'll see super Earths, I'll see sub Neptunes, I'll see dwarf ice giants and <laughs> gas giants and super Jupiters and super Jupiters. Yeah, super Jupiters. <laughs> yeah. It's just sort of like, okay, let's let's take a moment. And back away yeah. and figure out what of this is is just adding adjectives right. and what of this is based on science. Okay, so so then let's talk about the raw materials here that we have to work with. We have, I guess, the size of the planet, the mass of the planet, what it's made out of, and where it's located. Does that does that and cover every, it's, it's, everything that we might need? Mass and density and radius yeah, are yeah. trickstery. Sure. So start with those three, then add composition and phase state. Okay, phase state. Yeah, of course. <laughs> this is not just not just what they're made out of, but are they a liquid or are they solid or whatever? Yeah. Okay. All right. right. All right. So let's just pick one of those and we'll start. Okay. So so we're gonna start with the three big classifications that people then put stuff in between. And, and so the way I think of this is on the, the color wheel, we have our primary colors of red, yellow, blue, red, green, blue, depending on whose color wheel you're using. And it's really red, yellow, blue people, let's face it. And um, you can mix these things. So when it comes to planets, our primaries are we have terrestrial worlds, which is stuff that is solid for the majority of it and may have an atmosphere, but that is not where the dominant amount of mass is gone. Right. Okay. Then we have the ice giants. So we're increasing in size as we go. And ice giants are something that have a rocky core that is substantial but they're also surrounded by enough gas that their radius is dominated by this gassy atmosphere. And that gassy atmosphere is dominated by things that are heavier than hydrogen and helium. Got it. Okay. Metal, as astronomers would call it. Well, and, and what but... I've learned is planetary scientists call it ice because it's volatiles. Right. So this is stuff like methane and ammonia right. and... and stuff that you can make into ice right so if you pour alcohol in front of them they'll call that ice if you pour methane in front of them they'll call that ice if you, yeah it's it is very reductionist of the science isn't it just the the planetary scientists do add more classifications of material than the astronomers so i can't complain too much um then gas giants, which I mean, initially, and many of you learned there, there were terrestrial worlds and gas giants. So the thing that makes the gas giants and the ice giants different is not the mass. It's the composition, which turns out to be related to the mass. So the gas giants have atmospheres that dominate them by radius, and they are predominantly hydrogen and helium. Okay, so if we were to think about the kinds of worlds, we have the ones made of rock and metal, mostly, yes. with a thin envelope of gases, the ones made of hydrogen and helium with potentially some kind of rocky core down at the very middle yeah. of them, 
dominated. And then the ones that are sort of in between that have a rocky core, but then have heavier volatiles than hydrogen and helium. And those are sort of the three major classifications that you can expect to find out there. And you can pretty much stick every world that we find into one of those groups. And they don't necessarily form in the places we find them in our own galaxy, in our own solar system, rather. Uh, the, the thing about these worlds is they can get moved around by gravitational interactions. And there are some theories that have Uranus and Neptune forming between Jupiter and Saturn. Um, so so it's, it's more a matter of what kinds of conditions existed in the protoplanetary nebula. There's some really cool research that is finding that eddies and turbulent pockets inside protoplanetary disks may have the oomph needed to put together a planet. And so it could be that these icy objects, which are really gas but have heavier atoms, um, are formed in these turbulent pockets, whereas the rocky worlds tend to be things that have had the potential for atmospheres blown away and have formed through the building up of planetesimals. So put rocks together until you get a big rock and that's how you get to trust your world. And then the gas giants, it's looking like, and again, we don't know anything for certain with planetary formation. Um, it's looking like these, you start out with something that's like a 10 earth mass core and let it gravitationally pull in hydrogen and helium, and that's how you get a gas giant. Right. But, you know, as we went into the introduction here, you a gas giant can be the only a little bigger than the Earth. So you can have t teeny tiny versions of them. I, except those are called... Gas dwarfs. Still, yeah, and gas dwarfs are still in most cases thought to be 10 times the size of earth, which as an astronomer, I'm like, that's not a lot bigger than the earth, but for a planetary scientist is massive and they start calling those mega earths. Well, we did, we did a story fairly recently and the smallest mm -hmm. known gas dwarf is 60% bigger than the earth. Not now, not in terms of mass, just size. So okay. that's really small. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, you know, obviously, we have experience with terrestrial planets being rocky planets being very small. Mm -hmm. But and then we, and, and, I, and we have this definition of these mini Neptunes. So I mean, there's no rules. <laughs> <laughs> so so they attempt to have rules, they attempt to have rules. And one of the problems that they run into is trying to figure out, well, what's the density of the stuff making this thing up? Is it rock and water? Is it predominantly water? And with transient method detections, we can get the radius of these objects. And radius is a fabulous thing to have when you can have it. And it's because of the radius that we are starting to think that there are particularly fluffy planets. <coughs> so these are planets that, that appear to have superheated atmospheres that have poofed out. So we have puffy worlds. That's one format. Mm -hmm. Um, you can also have, however, uh, gas giants that, because they're snuggled in against their star, are getting their atmosphere stripped away. And as that occurs, are they evolving to become mega Earths? What do you call the intermediate stage? So is that one idea for how you might get a super Earth is you get the the atmosphere of the planet just blown away and yeah. then you're left with whatever remains? Like just yeah. the craziest comet ever? So you, you essentially take a Jupiter-ish world or up to larger. And there's been some stuff that people argue about found up at the 30 Jupiter mass range where you're starting to wonder, is this actually a brown dwarf? We're not going into that today. But you take a, a Jupiter world, you migrate it in. We've figured out lots of different ways to migrate planets in. We don't know which one is correct. Um, you migrate it in until it hits the point where the solar radiation, the solar wind, everything that it's experiencing is blowing away its atmosphere. And they do appear like crazy comets, we believe. But over time, 
you only can blow away atmosphere for so long when there's before there's absolutely no atmosphere to be blown away. Right. And what you get left behind is essentially a 10 Earth mass object, which is what we think the core of a Jupiter like world is. So is that now a super Earth? <laughs> right. And, and super Earths are definitely a thing. They have yeah. definitely been found and, and definitely pegged down to the point that they know that they're rocky. So what are the like the the limits of like when you think about a super Earth, what are we talking about here? In general, that when they say super Earth, they mean something that depending on which paper you're reading is two and a half, three times the size of the Earth up past those 10 Earth mass objects that are not surrounded by gas. The greater than 10 will also get subclassified into mega Earths. So for certain, if it's greater than 10 Earth masses, it's a mega Earth. A mega if Earth. It, I have never even heard that term before, mega Earth. I'm looking this up. Are you? If, you're just yanking my chain here now. I I am not. I I oh, went God, down. A, right. I went down a very sad rabbit hole of can you all talk to each other and come up with names? I am totally going to follow you I down found. this rabbit hole. This is the best. It was a fabulous rabbit hole, but but at the the end of the rabbit hole, what I discovered is it was not built by a single rabbit. It was built by many different rabbits. Some of them were cottontails. Some right. of them were jackrabbits. So it's a war. Some of them were jackalopes. Yeah. Um. <laughs> mega Earth. And so we have, we have super Earths. We have mega Earths. We have mini Neptunes. We have sub Neptunes. We have dwarf gas giants. We have super Jupiters. And when you see all these words, what I want you to think about is if they use the word Neptune, it means something that they believe has volatiles in its accent, right. in its atmosphere. If they say Jupiter, they mean something that is hydrogen helium dominated. If they say Earth, they mean something that is rocky and may have a veneer of atmosphere, but really it's a rock. And any other description is nonsense. It's an adjective. It's an, yeah, yeah. So a, a mega Mars, a mini Mercury, a super Pluto. Don't... You can use any adjective no. you want. That doesn't mean it has meaning. I guess. I mean, eventually, I'm sure somebody's going to say there's a super Pluto because they're talking about something that has the characteristics of a Kuiper belt object. But so now the... you're talking about Triton. Sure, but maybe it's the size of the Earth. <gasps> okay. Um, and there, there's where you start adding compositional mm -hmm. arguments. Mm -hmm. But something and... that's made of ice and that is made of water ice and yeah. rock. As opposed and to... Yeah, as opposed to, say, something that's made of... And then you could have a water world. So what's a water world? Is that a Earth and planet? So a water world is a weird density earth it is something that's density appears to be lower than what you would get if something was pure rock it has a radius that is not consistent with it having a massive gas atmosphere like a neptune or a jupiter and so in order to get that combination of lower density than rock radius that behaves like a terrestrial world you have to either cover the thing in water or fill it with water, pick one. We don't really know. Um, and that's where it starts getting cool is we can start to figure out small hints about the composition of planets when they're in systems that are such that through a combination of measuring Doppler shifting of the star, the motion of the star caused by the planet's gravity and the radius of the planet as it transits in front, this ability to measure both mass and radius allows us to get at the density. These, these are inaccurate measurements though, which is where things go slightly sideways because we don't know how non-round the orbit is right. and we don't know the tilt of it. We, we can put limits on both of these factors. We can put limits on the tilt by the fact that it's transiting. We can put limits on the ellipticity by knowing how long it takes to transit and how long it takes for it to go around the star. 
but these are limits and and so there's room for mistakes and there are mistakes at the level of how much rock to water ratio is there right uh and then we've got some even more interesting things i mean like did you hear about this world k2 141b the, the one with the magma ocean that's 100 kilometers deep. yeah so you've and, got and and Go ahead. Oh, so you've got this world that is orbiting its star every couple of hours, seven hours long, and it is so close and so hot that the front of the planet, it's tidally locked, and the front of the planet is molten lava that is then, um, uh, or is, is, is gasified on the front side it blown around to the backside at winds of 8,000 kilometers per hour and then falls as rain. But it's like it's raining lava. And then the lava is flowing back around. It could be hundreds of kilometers deep. And it is flowing back to the front. As far as we know from computer models. I yeah. just want to add that caveat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The world exists. It's definitely this close. And it's definitely this lava cover. We just don't know the, yeah. the kinetics of how yeah. it's and, all moving. And, and that not, comes from software. And they assume that it's that it's tidally yeah. locked. And so y y now you've got a world that is starting to grow a tail of rock as opposed yeah. to a tail of ice. So you could just see like the location really does seem to matter. And the tidal locking seems to matter as well about what you get. And my my personal favorite exoplanet is Kelp 9b. This is a world going around a super hot star, which is the kind of star we didn't think would have worlds. But researcher Scott Gowdy and his team at, I believe, the Ohio State University mm -hmm. took, a look, took a look at this star. And lo and behold, there is this massively heated planet super Jupiter, hot Jupiter, and the surface of the planet on the side facing the really hot star is roughly the temperature of our sun's surface. <laughs> right. And, and to be fair, this does not mean it has nuclear reactions going on or anything like that. There are not nuclear reactions going on at the surface of our sun. It's just to say this world's atmosphere is getting heated right. by the really bright, hot star to star-like temperatures. Yeah, the 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 surface of the sun doesn't hold a candle to the core of the sun where the fusion is happening. Yeah, the, the surface of the sun is the point that things finally cool down enough that it can escape into space. The center of the Earth is as hot as the surface of the sun. That. I think that's true. It is. I had never thought of that before. The, the center of the Earth is 6,200 Kelvin, and the surface of the sun is 5,800 Kelvin. Yeah. And I had never... Thank you. I learned something. You're welcome. Um... I, I picked that up in a book or a story somewhere. Yeah, yeah I've, I've, you know, there's these little tidbits that you hold on to where you're just like, yeah, I'm using that. The, yeah, the the you one just that have I to like. See the numbers side by side, and I. The, the this kudos. is this is a total rabbit hole, and feel free to to cut this if you want, Richard. But but I'm sure people dig it. Um, the when the universe cooled down to the point that the cosmic microwave background radiation could be released the universe was the color of a red star yeah so it was red that the light that that was fine that, that the the point that it could actually be released it was red it was about three thousand kelvin and so everything was red and then suddenly it cooled to this perfect moment that now light could actually be released so and and the sum of the colors today when you average across the components given by all the different sources of light out there is the color of a latte. Yes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Richard, you can decide whether you want to hold on to it. I'm sure you're going to keep it. But let's get back to the topic <laughs> at hand. Um, so then, you know, based on the, it feels to me now like that with these raw materials that we described at the beginning of this episode, that we've got the mass, we've got the radius, we've got the composition, we've got these these gas planets, these terrestrial planets, these these ice planets, that they can f be almost any mass and they can be in almost any location. 
So what are the limits? What, what should we expect to never find? So the limits come with how long something stays the way it is. So you can't expect a senior citizen of a star to have a hot Jupiter snuggled up next to it that still has a complete atmosphere. Um, Because at a certain point, you're going to have solar systems settle into a more finished format. Our own solar system probably had additional planets when it formed. We know it had at least a few additional planets when they when it formed that got consumed up by the planets that remain. Um, and once things start to settle into that final form, then evolution sees its way through to the end. You're not going to find an ocean world snuggled up against its sun. And this is where you start to think, okay, so how are we able to get what we see today? What are all the different routes? And this is where it starts to get interesting to imagine that Mercury, which we know is still undergoing low levels of mass loss from interacting with the sun's high energy particles, cosmic rays, massive amounts of light. It could have had water wherever it initially formed and has been made smaller It has crack lines in it from this, all because it's so close to the sun and lost every volatile it could possibly lose, except for those in the permanently shattered craters. And that water was brought later. Right. So it's a it's a dried out apple. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And cracked and shrunk with all of its volatiles. And you're in Neptune couldn't have formed where they are. Right. And if there is a Planet Nine, it probably got stolen from some other system. And so there's all these neat limits on where can things stay over time. So the limits are in a very young solar system that hasn't had time to go through all the wild kinematics. You're not going to find the worlds in the outskirts, the the 30 to 50 astronomical unit distances in old solar systems you're not going to find the hot jupiters that still have very thick atmospheres and it's in how things evolve that we limit and other than that the universe is going to do what it will it just may not be allowed to keep the outcomes it's it's funny i mean we have been uh We've been so excited about finding planets. And at this point, we know of however many thousands of planets that, that we know of, thanks to Kepler and Tess and all this kind of stuff. But it still is, it's nowhere near enough to start answering some of these deeper questions that we need to know about how it all works. We need yeah. to know about hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions of planets until we can finally go, okay, if you've got a s- star of this age, with you know this kind of temperature output and this kind of existing planets and the then the this is what you tend to see and if you've got those this is what you tend and here's how they tend to migrate and to come up with the simulations that finally describe how a place like even the solar system just trying to just to get to the point that we can say where did the solar system come from you'll need to have surveyed a huge chunk of the milky way to be able to do that and this is where we really wished that we had the globular clusters that had planets in them because we can get a deep and rich understanding of stellar evolution by looking at these individual laboratories that each have their own metallicity each have their own age and allow us to start to see what are the relationships between how stars look as a function of age and then how does your metallicity change those evolutionary tracks with stars that have planets, we sometimes are able to see the youngest stars still in the open cluster where they formed, where we can start to compare the formation of proclids, of planetary yeah. disks among different protostars. But once those open clusters have gone a couple times around the galaxy, they are no more. Mm-hmm. And we don't have that laboratory left where we can say all these stars are definitely the same generation. All these stars are the same composition. Here's now how we look at planet formation as a function of mass, which we'd love to do. Yeah. 
okay, let's now look at hold the mass constant, change the metallicity, which is, these are all things we could do if only globular clusters had planets and they don't. Right. So yeah. these are things that we really, really wish. But you can get a hint at the metallicity of a, of a star, can't you? You, you can definitely get the metallicity of the stars, but you don't have this laboratory of 10,000 identical stars all in one field right, of view. Right, right. And it's, it's the convenience that you're missing. And there was another study fairly recent where they tried to compare any, um, they're trying to see if there's any combination between um, the type of star, the age of the star, or the type of star and the metallicity of the star, I believe, and whether or not it had planets, and they couldn't find any correlation whatsoever. So if you see a star, that tells yeah. you nothing about whether or not it has planets, unfortunately. Yeah. So um, it just it just shows you. I mean, we're so excited about all the planets that we know about, and yet the reality is that we don't know anything. We don't know a hint of a fraction that we can see so many different kinds of planets, things that we never expected to see. And now we have no idea beyond just the most basic understanding of of how they got to be the sizes that they are and the places that they got to be and the composition that they are and so there is a long exciting future ahead for planetary exoplanetary it's, astronomy it's such a young field yeah planets were first discovered 28 years ago and normal planets were only found 25 years ago it's such a young field yeah so i can't wait to see where it develops as we increase our spacecraft and our spectrographs here on the planet. Yeah, I did a video about six months ago talking about like someone had done an estimate. If you just like take a, if you follow the exponential curve of just planet discoveries and you just follow it, if you just continue to map it up like like Moore's law, but planetary discoveries, we should hit fifty million planets discovered by twenty fifty. Then that's awesome. Then we can do some nice statistical analysis and get a sense yeah. of what's actually going on. All right, Pamela, that was awesome. Uh, do you have some names for us this week? I do. As always, we are supported through the generous contributions of, well, you. And this allows us to pay the wonderful people working behind the scenes to simulcast this to uh, Richard. Thank you for all the audio mistakes you put up with to get the videos posted, to do transcripts, keep our website up to date. There is a small crew of all part-time people that make this happen. And your donations from a much larger crew allow us to do that. So I would like to thank this week, Donald Munda, Scott Bieber, Kenneth Ryan, Bart Flannerty, uh, Andrew Stevenson, Stephen Coffey, Glenn McDonald, Benjamin Davies, Anthony Burgess, Gabriel Galfin, Martin Dawson, Russell Petto, Ryan James, Dean, Nalia Brento, Kimberly Reich, uh, Shannon Humber, Claudia Mastrolani, The Air Major, Eric Faniger, Jessica Feltz, Daniel Loosley, Rachel Fry, Dwayne Isaac, and I'm going to stop there and right. say thank you, all of you, for what you do to make everything we do possible. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. So, so over on Twitch, and there is saved. all sorts of dialogue going on about the skeletal dragon head mounted on the wall behind me. And I know we've been getting Twitch comments about it. So, so I, I want to say the skeletal dragon brings me no end of joy and is hiding a really ugly power outlet. If you have other ideas for hiding the really ugly power outlet, I'm open to no. other ideas. What do you mean? I you have come up with the greatest. Dragon. Yeah, you come up with the greatest way to hide a power outlet. Are you kidding me? And and so he will be getting decorated for Christmas. He will be changing through the seasons. Um, I love my dragon. I'm sorry. I'm a goth girl at heart. I just don't get to show it very often. Um, but you picked it up like. At like a Halloween store or something like that, right? Like you didn't. I, I got it from the Target Halloween department. It's yeah. totally a Halloween direct. Yeah. Uh, decoration, but it gets to stay. 
I have a little Santa hat I'm going to put on it that was meant for the dogs, but we'll work on it. And yeah, so it's not like it was some kind of special fancy uh, no, dragon, it was like $15. dragon mold that you bought on Etsy from no. some handcrafted. No, you just you just got it. Awesome. It's just a piece of plastic. Yeah, that's it. But incredible. it's one that I adore. Yeah. Um, all right. So Ben Kayla wants to know how I remember so much. Uh, one, <laughs> one you word. write it and then it goes into no, your brain no, forever no, no I actually have a, I do I, I do this on purpose which is I use a piece of software called Anki yeah and so I actually f jam knowledge into my brain to try to maintain it so um, yeah so look that up Anki um, so I will do things, for example, if I do a show and I make and and I didn't know the answer to questions when I do the show, then I will watch the show afterwards. I'll write down all the questions I didn't know the answer to. I will learn the answers and I will practice them so that next time I am able to do it. So it looks like I, I, I don't think I've ever talked about this, but it looks like I'm just like, oh, yeah, I got all this data in my head. And I just like, you know, it's it's well, a trick. And I, I actually and, practice this specifically. And we read so many press releases that then force us to go and reread stories that we've written in the past because science is a cycle. It's moving forward, but repeating things that it is simply adding detail as it goes. It's like watching a GIF render or GIF. I don't care. Please don't <laughs> fight me on this one. Um, and... It's really funny because Beth Johnson has started co-hosting Daily Space with me over on our CosmoQuest stuff. And she's like, oh, my God, I finally understand why Pamela knows so much. It's from reading all of these articles. It's like, right. Yes, Beth, yeah. Is, and so the yes. next and so the next step to reading all this stuff and writing all this stuff is to use something like Anki to be able to because, I mean, obviously you can look this stuff up all the time. I mean, you can just you can just look it up. That's what Google's for. But there is a value to being able to synthesize it directly and so and so to, to have all these random pieces of facts and if you if you so that i know offhand what the escape velocity of mars is and what the escape velocity of the moon is and and so i can know or i know what the temperature of the earth's core is and the temperature of the sun is and so you can you can synthesize those stuff in real time and so there's real value to you know, I, I wouldn't recommend it for somebody who isn't trying to learn a language or isn't practicing to be a doctor, right, to learn all that medical terminology or specifically what I do. But there's um, there's a lot of computer programmers, a lot of computer scientists as well that that do it, too, that they will, um, you know, it's you just, how you remember commands. Yeah, you remember commands, you remember obscure parts of the language like there. I think yeah. I think there's a ton, even though we we don't need to remember trivia anymore. There is value in being able to have access to stuff quickly and be able to synthesize it in real time as you're working on projects, because then yeah. you can, as you're working on a pay, on a story about something, you go like, I remember this and that and that and this, and it can be the starting point to then pull that stuff in and create a richer, whatever it is you're working on. And, and one of the things that I found that, has really helped my writing, for instance, is I will sit down in the morning and read all the articles related to the story I'm going to write, go take a shower, go make my breakfast, go get the second cup of coffee, whatever I need to do, and let things percolate through my head. And because I've read everything ahead, it's in there enough that I can get going and i've seen a lot of people who like be writing and reading at the same time and it's just not as effective no 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 i i mean it's if if you have no other choice like if i'm going to write a story about something that i don't know anything about then then i've got to start from square one and go like mm -hmm. what is this and what you know what is the electron and what is the rocket lab and why is it called return to sender etc um but if i know all yourself the pieces space. if i know all the pieces yeah. because of having read it in in advance or or having a lot mm -hmm. of it just in my working memory then the thing that i'm looking for is what's new yeah and and that is the part that you can then 
in th- that then you can you can write everything else. Yeah. You know, if you tell me that Rocket Labs has made a lighter version of its Rutherford engine, I already know they weigh 35 kilograms. So Is there a video out yet of them catching it? Uh, there was one, I don't know if there's a video of them catching it. I've, I saw some pictures of it in the water. I didn't watch the whole live okay. stream yesterday. I know a lot of people okay. did, but. So the live stream ended before the, the first stage was retrieved. Right. Um, yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't see the, the actual catch, but I, but we, but I saw pictures of it floating in the ocean, which I'm sure is just great for a, uh, for a rocket. <gasps> um, Oh, there you go. Uncle Willie's saying they didn't try to catch it. So I think they just let it soft mm-hmm. land into the ocean and then they recover. Okay. And they're going to see how well it how well it worked out. Okay. I wonder if they can do a full-on Falcon 9 landing with the first stage. I don't think so at that size. Not enough not enough juice. Well, and and the the way I think about it is if you have five percent empty space in something that is three stories high that's a whole lot of empty space that you can stick stuff in if you have something that's five percent empty space and it's 50 feet high whatever's smaller it's it's so much less space that you can't fit in the same percentage excess space all the stuff you need to return because it doesn't all scale linearly Um, most of it scales as the cube and yeah it's just a hot mess and then you have all the stuff that you just can't change the size of the computers that control all those engines they're not going to change in size right yeah yeah so it's funny i mean this goes back to elon musk saying that in fact the the super heavy and starship combo is the minimum size to do a fully yeah. reusable two-stage rocket that the math just gets better and better as you get bigger and bigger from this yeah, point forward. Yeah, it really does. Yeah, because all of those things, as you say, the computers, the the fuel lines, the the stabilizers, all of these things don't need to scale up in the way that that the fuel does for the bigger yeah. and bigger rockets. And so the the excess weight, what what do they call it? The the dry weight can yeah. can scale nicely, and you just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but it is exciting. I mean, you know, if you're not going to try to recover your rocket at this point in the curve, don't even play. <laughs> right. I mean, seriously, like, like right now, the Falcon nine is recovering that first stage and reusing those rockets over and over again for a significant yeah. cost savings over anybody else who wants to try and launch anything into space. And this isn't their big plan. So I really feel like we need to start up a betting pool on when SLS will finally be killed. Oh. <sighs> I, I honestly suspect that as soon as Bezos can get his stuff working consistently, SLS is dead. Yeah, I, I, I talked about this earlier this week that, that I think we're in this weird, weird, funny in-between time where you've got the, like, the Falcon Heavy works, but it's not quite strong enough. You've yeah. got the Blue Origin, which is going to be have a, a reusable first stage and will be strong enough, but it doesn't exist yet. And right. then you got the Space Launch System, which is plenty strong, Vaporware. but is not ready and way too expensive compared to the other options. And so the yeah. answer is, and then of course Starship is vapor. Starship is vaporware, and okay. so you don't have anything right now. And so nobody has a firm foundation to go anywhere. <laughs> I guess the thing that gets me about Starship is we can see it advancing and getting tested. Mm-hmm. We're not seeing that same level of iterative design mm-hmm. with SLS. Yeah, but it's still like old school. Like we're, we are seeing tests with SLS. Like I think, and the and it's built on fairly proven hardware with the same kind of tank that the space shuttle had, the same kind of rocket engine the space shuttle, yeah. same kind of solid rocket boosters. Like really it's a space that's shuttle. That's technology that's just, as old as we are. Oh, I know. It's just a space shuttle that's been made vertical. That's all. And so I think that that they feel pretty confident that they can get this thing to function as as required. And and so if I was in charge of it's funny, like if you were in charge of NASA, what would you do? I mean I would just put robotic arms on everything. Um, <laughs> that's because you're Canadian. Yeah, I know. That's what we do. That's what we do. <laughs> we can solve every problem with more robotic arms. Um, but no, I, 
I would I would launch everything on Falcon Heavies. Falcon Heavies okay. and Crew Dragons is what I would do for now because that is proven. It exists. Yeah. It's inexpensive and it gets the job done. That's what I would do. And then as soon as Blue Origin showed up to the party, then I would shift some of my launching to them. I would cancel SLS immediately. Yes. Yes. And and that's the thing is I I think I would do much harder uh if you don't get this stuff done, you're done. You're done. Um, and and invest a whole lot much, a whole lot more money into the R and D. Yeah, but because I really feel like they're not putting enough money into the development phase, and then they're finding all of the problems in the implementation phase. But the, I mean, if you spend more money on the space launch system, you're just spending more money on the space launch system. Even if you say it must be done, it doesn't matter because what's going to be done is ridiculously overpriced and mm -hmm. not sustainable. So, oh, it would have been done for me long ago. Yeah, like when you say done, not not completed, you mean done oh. as in canceled. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And so just cancel in the, it. We are done with you. Yeah. Kind yeah. Of. Yeah. And so the fact the Falcon Heavy showed up and can deliver uh, a third of the mass. Yeah load for a tenth the price what, yeah. what does a falcon heavy cost 90 million dollars a launch i think yeah so, so, a, so a 20th the price yeah no and and bezos is getting his lower lift vehicles off the ground into the, the space station we've so. seen them build the we're we've seen the fairing yeah like they, they like so i think they're they're going to be i think in 2021 they'll roll up with one and they'll fly it and it'll work yeah. that's that's my feeling and the way they're approaching it um which i think is a mistake i think they should be they should be smashing them all over the place the way spacex does yeah but it's but they're doing that with the new shepherd to demonstrate the capability i guess in their mind the new glenn is the same as the new shepherd it's just bigger yeah I disagree. But anyway, so it's a weird time. It's a weird time. This will all be resolved. If next year Starship returns from space nicely and makes it through the atmosphere, then every other rocket system on Earth is irrelevant. Yeah. If it doesn't, then you, mm. you're you going to need this combination of stuff. I, I, I think Blue Origin is still working on their tiny glider. Tiny it, glider? Yeah. I, I, I could be forgetting but at one point blue origin was working on like a four-seater launches in a, on a rocket lands like a glider Are you reusable about a dream chaser yeah yeah that's some um, not blue origin okay <sighs> that i still see a role for if it's, it's a cargo it's constructed. a cargo ship no no it's a totally different you and you just like stick one of those inside a starship <laughs> <laughs> we just eat the whole thing no problem. <laughs> so no, um, it's a, it's, you could launch your cargo on a starship for cheaper than you could launch your cargo on a, on a rocket lab rocket. So it's just, there's nothing is going to compare, but it, but, but if it works and I don't yeah. think it's going to work right away, well, it's going to take And I don't know what the frequency work. is going to be. Because I can imagine being able to do a lot more smaller things at a higher frequency. If it works, and, Starship yeah. will fly every four hours. The same Starship. That seems a bit excessive. Okay. Oh, I had no oh wait. Idea. So hold on a second. Every four hours for the Super Heavy, every eight hours for the Starship. So you could take the same Starship and launch it three times a day for the price of fuel. All and, right. and the price of fuel is less than the cost of a of a of an electrum rocket. So these these are the details rocket. I did not have in my head. So it's just and like I just, stand just, massively correct. Yeah, yeah, but but my guess is for years, maybe a decade, we're just going to see a shrieking, tangled mass of stainless steel come plummeting through the atmosphere, lighting on fire, and crashing into the ocean off the coast of uh, Texas. That's what we'll see. And you won't want to get on that. No. So, or put your James Webb replacement on it. <laughs> I just want something to launch Europa Clipper because it's currently missing a rocket. Yeah, it'll launch just fine on a Falcon Heavy. No problem. Yeah. You just have to do a couple of flybys. Anyway, we've gone way over. 
<laughs> we have. We so, are planning to start. Sierra <laughs> Nevada Dream Chaser. There you go. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for watching us today. Thank you, Pamela, for bringing the brain and the dogs and the leaf blowers, the lack of leaf blowers. <laughs> Um, thank you, uh, Nancy Graziano, for putting up with our nonsense this week and the last couple of weeks as we reorganized and, and rescheduled. Richard Drum. Richard for deciding whether or not to edit our rabbit holes. And we will uh, see all of you. Uh, let's see. Star Party Saturday. Uh, open Space Monday. Interview we'll be doing... with the project manager of... The Juice mission next week on the Weekly Space Hangout, pre-recorded. I've done the interview. Um, anything happening for you? Yeah, we have the Daily Space going up on Tuesday. And, oh, my God, there's so much science that, that has just come out in the past yeah. few hours. Yeah. Um, and Wednesday, um, we are going to basically just be bringing you the news because that's what we do. Read it on his site. Watch it on ours. Pick one. Pick Sounds both, good. probably. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week.